I wanna thank you for joining me as we dive into the word this morning. We are in our fourth week and our final week of looking at how to pray through the models that we are given in the book of Psalms. We have 150 recorded prayers and songs and people processing their emotions before God. We are using them and learning from them models of how to bring our emotions and all of ourself into God's presence. There are in this teaching five categories of Psalms we are looking at, ranging from wisdom Psalms to lamentations to imprecatory psalms or cursing psalms, asking God to show justice on someone who's performing evil, royal psalms, which we actually did not cover in this series of teaching, and then finally, thanksgiving psalms, which we'll be talking about today. The psalms themselves are 3,000-year-old model in order to teach us how to pray. And as we read the wild emotions, vulnerability, and anger, it should give us permission to bring all of ourselves before God. As we talk about Thanksgiving Psalms today, I wanna encourage you to be entering into a model of gratitude. It is very easy, and we don't really have to teach this, but to enter into life jaded, frustrated, critical of life and what has happened to us, it's a very natural part of being human and the brokenness and sin of us, but we need to pray thanksgiving in our lives in order to rewire our minds and our hearts to be grateful for what God has done in this world. Thanksgiving Psalms make up roughly 15% of the book of Psalms or about 24 of the Psalms are Thanksgiving Psalms. And in them, we can rewire ourselves to see life as a gift, to see God's character as beautiful and to see our own lives as a privilege to be able to live and love here on earth with a God who loves us through Christ Jesus. Jim Wilder is a theologian and psychologist who has written a lot about joy specifically and how to affect our own minds and hearts by practicing gratitude in our lives. Jim Wilder writes, when we keep practicing gratitude with God, our brain remembers what our connection with him was like making it easier for us to find our way back to him. You have moments of joy and gratitude in your life. If you're a follower of Jesus, I am confident that you can think of several examples of what Jesus has meant to you, what God has done for you, and who he is in your life. We just get caught up in the pace of our life and we forget these moments. I'm gonna encourage you, before we even go into the text today, to practice something called a gratitude journal or uh, joy meditations where you try to think up and you can begin with just three, three experiences where you felt deep gratitude in your life. Whether it was an experience in church, reading scripture, hanging out with friends, being out in nature, but moments where you recognize the goodness of God and felt that joy. I'm gonna challenge you, it needs to be a moment that elicits a feeling in you, draws you back to what it felt like to be in that place. If what you're writing down doesn't bring that sort of a response in you, that's not the ones we're looking for. Find moments where you felt in your heart and soul joy, gratitude, and the goodness of God. Write them down, and then throughout this holiday season, Meditate on them each day. Begin your day reminding yourself of those moments and begin, as Jim Wilder writes, to rewire your brain towards gratitude. Remember them and meditate on them. Today we'll look at an example of King David and his own act of doing this, his own process of reminding himself of who God was and is, his own process of rewiring his spiritual orientation towards gratitude and thankfulness. We will see this in Psalm 103. We're gonna study Psalm 103 together in its entirety and look at it as an example for our own rewiring towards thanksgiving, gratitude, and praise. Let's read it together, beginning in verses one and two. David writes, "'Let all that I am praise the Lord. "'With my whole heart I will praise his holy name.'" Let all that I am 
Praise the Lord. May I never forget the good things he does for me. We begin this psalm with a bit of a challenge over gratitude or thankfulness itself. We think of gratitude, thankfulness, even praise as responses to moments in the present. I'm in church and there's a particular song that responds to my heart or my soul, maybe a new one with a lot of energy or maybe one that connects to my childhood. And then I respond in thankfulness. Yeah, God, I am reminded of how good you are and we offer thankfulness. Or an experience in life, being around the Thanksgiving table with family we really love or spending time with friends. And then we offer gratitude back for it. But David actually begins this psalm in a different manner. He says, to remember the gratitude he has. He says, let all that I am, almost in a way of him forcing himself into this. It's an act of the will. There are moments of gratitude and thankfulness that erupt naturally, absolutely. But more often, as human beings live in a broken, sinful life, in a broken, sinful world, we need to will ourselves into an attitude of thankfulness and gratitude. David begins this, I am willing myself into this. Come on, let's move myself into this attitude. Let's remind myself of who God is. I am going to shift my perspective to one of gratitude. If I only say, I love you to my wife in moments where I am in the throes of passion, is it really love or is it just emotionalism and desire? Love speaks in the moments where we cannot see the reasons why, we draw back into the character and the history to remind ourselves of gratitude and love. Hebrews 13 verse five, New Testament pastor and author says this to the church, therefore, let us offer through Jesus a continual sacrifice of praise to God, proclaiming our allegiance to his name. It is a sacrifice sometimes to offer praise and gratitude. It's a work to get there. And if you haven't realized it yet in this series of teaching through Psalms, the pattern of praying the Psalms is an act of transcendence over our present thoughts and feelings. And in that transcendence, we turn ourselves towards God and recognize that he has more for us than our present reality. Praying the Psalms and the reason they exist for us in the modern world is to elevate us out of our current moment and experience and realign us with the wide work of what God is doing and the depth of his character. In moving ourselves and willing ourselves into gratitude, we transcend our current circumstances and we bring the goodness of God into our life. Continuing, Psalm 103, verses three through seven. David writing about what God has done. He forgives all my sins and he heals all my diseases. He redeems me from death and he crowns me with love and tender mercies. He fills my life with good things. My youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord gives righteousness and justice to all who are treated unfairly. He revealed his character to Moses and his deeds to the people of Israel. As we will ourselves into an attitude and a mindset of gratitude and praise, we then align ourselves that thankfulness is a response to the impressive acts of God. This is why we find throughout Psalms lists of what God has done, what he's done for his people, what he's done for us. This is a regular pattern of prayer in the Psalms, is listing what God has done, reminding our fickle, forgetful minds of what our God has already done and is doing for us. David writes several active verbs of what God has done and is doing. The Lord forgives, the Lord heals, the Lord redeems, the Lord crowns, and the Lord satisfies. These are activities that God is doing right now. These are activities we should be grateful for, that our God is a healer, our God's a forgiver, a redeemer, one who crowns us with glory and honor we don't deserve and who satisfies the cries of our heart. 
his impressive nature and what he does are also personal. In these couple verses, over and over again, he uses the pronouns of my and me, our. It's taking God's work and personalizing it. That God just hasn't done things in the pages of scripture. He's doing things for me right now in the present. In our prayer lives, as we offer prayers of gratitude and thankfulness, we can take God's activities and recognize them in our lives. God, I am grateful that you heal me. God, I'm grateful you have forgiven me. I'm grateful you've chosen to honor and work through me. We bring our thankfulness into personal recognition of what God is doing in our lives. Continuing, verses 8 through 13. The Lord is compassionate and merciful, slow to get angry, and filled with unfailing love. He will not constantly accuse us, nor remain angry forever. He does not punish us for all our sins. He does not deal harshly with us as we deserve. For his unfailing love towards those who fear him is as great as the height of the heavens above the earth. He has removed our sins as far from us as the east is from the west. The Lord is like a father to his children, tender and compassionate to those who fear him. Thanksgiving is not just a response to God's acts, but as we push deeper in our gratitude prayers, Thanksgiving is about the character of God, the very nature of who he is as revealed in Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In this passage, David lists out seven characteristics of God in this passage. That God is compassionate and merciful, that he is slow to anger. The Old Testament language specifically is long of nostril. Sort of like if a parent gets exasperated and they make that sound, but that God has really long nostrils. So when he blows his breath out in frustration, it takes a long time for God to get to that moment. He's long of nostril. He is slow to anger. He is filled with unfailing love. He is merciful. He is forgiving. He is healer. And he is, my favorite one, he is tender. He is a tender father drawing us into his arms. And if that language may sound familiar to you, even as I read these verses, that's true. And it's for a reason. This psalmist, David, is quoting the most quoted passage in all of the scripture by scripture. Exodus 34, verses 6 and 7. Let's read them together. This is God speaking to Moses on the top of Mount Sinai when Moses asked him, can I just meet you or see you or catch a glimpse of your glory? This is the character God reveals to Moses. This is what God declares of his own nature and character. Yahweh, Yahweh, I am, I am. The God of compassion and mercy. I am slow to anger and filled with unfailing love and faithfulness. I lavish unfailing love to a thousand generations. I forgive iniquity, rebellion, and sin, but I do not excuse the guilty. I lay the sins of the parents upon their children and grandchildren. The entire family is affected, even children to the third and fourth generations. The latter part of this rings a little harsh to us in the modern world, but be reminded as over the last few years, we have seen anger and pain over injustice That what God is saying here is, I am a God of justice and evil and injustice will be punished. I will draw out the sin of how you have hurt each other and those who have taken advantage and all those who have been taken advantage of, I will comfort. This is the nature of God. These are the most quoted verses in all of the Bible. They are about the character of God. And more often than anything else, the Bible reaches back speaks to and reminds us of the character of God. A.W. Tozer, a American theologian in the last century, writes this famous passage, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. What we think about God in our gratitude. As we live our lives and don't practice these prayers, Our view of God gets smaller and smaller. 
The more we sit under and practice gratitude, when I go to a worship night and we declare these songs about the bigness of God, the goodness of God, when I take a hike out into nature and I see the scope of his creation, when I have a significant conversation with someone I love and they share a testimony of God's provision in their life, my view of God gets bigger and bigger. And the mystery of him also grows. And I think he is so great, so big, so vast, I could study him my whole life and barely scratch the surface. This informs and shapes who we are. And honestly, perhaps it is better to struggle a little bit to understand a very big, vast God than to shrink God down and say, I totally understand the size and scope of this God. I would rather sit under the vastness of his beauty than understand a simplified version of him. As we're thankful, God grows and we recognize the character of our God. This then moves us into the next verses, 14 through 18. For he knows how weak we are. He remembers we are only dust. Our days on earth are like grass, like wildflowers. We bloom and we die. The wind blows and we are gone as though we had never been here. But the love of the Lord remains forever with those who fear him. His salvation extends to the children's children of those who are faithful to his covenant, of those who obey his commands. We learn from David here that thanksgiving prayers realign our perspective of self. I realign who I am and I realign my problems. When I'm praying just for what I want and my desperate prayers of need and healing and doors to open, it has the problematic result of making it all about me. And my problems get really big and my care gets really big and I become really important in the center of my prayer life. As we practice prayers of gratitude and thankfulness, as we see the character of God, the bigness and his beauty, we shrink by comparison. As one author writes, no one has ever gone and seen the northern lights and then said, I am so great. As we see the size and scope of our God, it reminds us that we are just a part of the grand story God is moving and working. We have the privilege to be a part of God's good story. It's not our story. It is his story we get to be a part of. As Genesis 3.19 says, From dust we were made, and to dust we will return. That can be a little harsh or maybe depressing as we read that. But it aligns us that this life is not about me. It's not about my legacy and my story. It is about what I can contribute as an act of love to demonstrate the loving character of the God who has made me and who has made all of creation and his image bearers. When we are praying, We are entering into an unequal, miraculous communion with an omnipotent, all-powerful, righteous God who has humbled himself to meet us broken, sinful people. But if thinking of ourselves as dirt is a little bit harsh, I want to remind you that we are not dirt in the scope of God. 1 Peter 2, verse 9 says, But you are not like that. You are a chosen people. You are royal priests, a holy nation, God's very own possession. As a result, you can show others the goodness of God, for he called you out of darkness into a wonderful light. We may are made from dust and our bodies will return to dust, but because of Jesus, and this is what we have that the psalmist doesn't, is we have the resurrection of Christ Jesus in us, through us, and to look forward to. And through Jesus, we are not just dust, but we are a royal nation. We are a priesthood. We are hands and feet of love and reconciliation. And we have an eternity to look forward to because of the life, death, and resurrection of Christ Jesus. Now let's finish out this psalm, verses 19 through 22. The Lord has made the heavens his throne. From there he rules over everything. Praise the Lord, you angels, you mighty ones who carry out his plans, listening for each of his commands. Yes, praise the Lord, you armies of angels who serve him and do his will. Praise the Lord, 
everything he has created, everything in all of his kingdom. Let all that I am praise the Lord. As we pray prayers of thanksgiving, we are also recognizing the lordship of the God we are praying to. We are placing ourselves under his authority as we recognize his creation, beauty, and power above us. This is hard in the modern world. This is hard in the realm in which I am recording and preaching and pastoring today. We have struggled to see authority as a good thing. We've seen a lot of the evils of authority and power and lordship over people and over God's creation. We've seen the destructive nature of it. So when we talk about the authority of God or the authority of Christ Jesus resurrected and enthroned at the right hand of God, it's hard for us to sometimes say, yeah, I'm just going to submit under that. I'm going to just give in to that. And it is so easy to be critical and sarcastic and jaded. Almost everyone I know in my life has easily put on that mantle. It's easy to criticize the church. It is easy to criticize simple theology. It is easy to criticize the nature of our lives. There's a lot of pain to see. As we see David write, it takes courage and will to press beyond that and to recognize the beauty of what God is doing deeper, higher, and through all of that. To be thankful is to submit ourselves under the beauty and creation of God. Being thankful is a humbling act. As we pray prayers of gratitude and thankfulness, we are humbling ourselves and recognizing that it's not about us or our power or our authority. It is about what God has done for us and in us and is going to do in remaking all of this creation by Christ Jesus himself. And that is not a harsh thing. It is a beautiful thing to say it is not about me. The correction and authority of this world doesn't rest on my shoulders. As we pray Thanksgiving Psalms, we discover, as David writes here, the freedom of an eagle able to fly knowing that our God has it all under control as we pray and receive his beauty and grace. Some of you may be watching this and you may not have a relationship with God. You may not know Jesus personally. I want to give you an opportunity to offer a simple prayer as one step towards that authority, one step towards the character of God that we know through Christ Jesus, his son. Pray this with me in this moment. God, today, I want to know you deeper and more richly. I want to take one step towards Christ Jesus. I want to recognize you, Jesus, as Lord and Savior of my life. I believe that you were God and man in one flesh, that you lived the perfect life here on earth, that you took my sin and shame onto yourself on the cross, and you died in my place instead of me that you were buried in the ground and you were resurrected on the third day, glorified bodily, reigning and ruling in heaven, and that by trusting in you, I may have eternal life and look forward to the resurrection and that fullness of life today. You gave your life for me. Today, I commit my life to follow you. I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. If you prayed that for the first time today, I encourage you to just click one of the links around this video. We would love to celebrate with you and walk this journey together. Thank you for joining me for this teaching from Pennington AG Church.